Hi guys, welcome to this recording for the second part of this week. We are the week before the uh, last basically uh, exam, so uh, or at least exam three. So I, go, I guess you guys are uh, doing the review. So I'm gonna again follow up with the reminders for those who don't do the review. Anyway, we are finishing uh, chapter basically 24, and also we're going to be uh, there will be another recording uh, early next week for uh, chapter 25 for uh, the content basically related to uh, the uh, basically the atomic model and also from from nuclear physics what we're going to do in chapter 25 is actually we're going to focus on uh, radioactivity which is due to uh, something called the weak nuclear force and we're going to also consider the the nuclear interactions basically for fusion and fission those are the last two topics basically that need to be covered for this uh, for this class and nuclear fusion fission are actually what is known as strong nuclear force. So that's basically the concept, some of the concepts that we'll be covering. We're not going to really delve into nuclear physics per se, we're going to try to understand the structure of the nucleus and uh, uh, because it requires a lot of time actually, and there is another other concepts and we basically, those are the concepts that were planned anyway for this class. So let me share with you what we did last time so that we can finish the topic. So again, there will be another uh, recording at least uh, early next week for chapter 25. So last time, basically what we did, we introduced the concept of uh, quantum mechanics early. This is what it's called. And uh, the idea behind it is that the model of Bohr was actually uh, short in a sense that it did not really explain the uh, a uh, lot of other things. I mean, it was successful in determining, for example, the energy levels of the hydrogen atom and also explaining the different spectra for the hydrogen atom, including those that were not even discovered then, namely outside of the uh, visible region, namely the infrared and also the, uh, the uh, ultraviolet uh, radiations. Technology at that time when uh, the model was developed was not advanced enough and actually were not known later on. They actually matched even Bohr's model. But Bohr's model, as we said last time, fell short of several things. First of all, it could not account, for example, for non-hydrogen atoms, and the periodic table is full of them. The other thing also is that uh, it did not really explain the periodic table per se uh, exactly, so uh, it fell short of those things too. And uh, it was uh, based on... Uh, uh, so it does not explain the rest of the elements in the periodic table. And also there was a big flaw in it in the sense that um, since it relied on classical mechanics and also Maxwell's equations, uh, those they predict that the atom would not be stable. So there was a confusion into what's going on in here. I know that uh, we said that Mr. Bohr made a postulate saying that the electron orbits are in the stable orbits, but that's just basically like an added uh, 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 statement basically just to keep the atom from falling apart but the fact is since you based it on classical mechanics namely Newton's laws of motion and also uh, Coulomb's uh, force then in this sense that uh, the atom is not stable so there is a kind of contradiction in here so again uh, there was other things that were discovered later on like the fine uh, structure which is really a splitting of the uh, spectral lines for the hydrogen atom, for example, and all of the other elements, as a matter of fact, they do exhibit that. When uh, present in a strong magnetic field, case in point, when we were, uh, scientists were looking at, or astronomers, astrophysicists were looking for the spectra in the uh, sunspots, which are uh, regions where the magnetic field is basically twisting and entangled uh, on the surface of the sun, and the magnetic field is super strong in those regions. And uh, that shows the splitting that uh, even Bohr's model in here, which was successful in explaining the spectrum of the hydrogen, could not explain the spectrum of the hydrogen in those regions of the sun. So all of these problems basically led, the pro led people to try to find a solution to this. It was Mr. De Broil actually who basically suggested that uh, following in the footsteps of what Mr. Einstein has done in extending the work of Mr. Planck, by stating that the uh, waves behave as particles, Mr. De Broglie basically suggested, why not the other way around, in a sense that also particles behave like waves. And for that, he had an expression, 
for the momentum, I mean, for the wavelength of these particles, which is inversely proportional to uh, the, uh, the momentum. So now, if you have momentum, which is due to, for a particle, like an electron, for example, that electron will also have a wavelength. And that led to, among other things, the, uh, the electron microscope, for example, which is technology that nowadays is available everywhere in uh, high-tech uh, labs and also in medical fields. So, uh, but uh, of course, that immediately, I mean, when it was developed in the early uh, 1920s, uh, people needed to understand it when it came from and so on and so forth. It was uh, the experiments of uh, Mr. D Davison and Mr. Germer that basically led to a conf confirmation of this, this observation. And also uh, then it led to the model that later on started to be built by, among other things, Schrodinger on one side, and Heisenberg was working on another one. So there was actually two competing approaches to the same problem. And until today, actually, those two approaches exist for the same problem. But we, most of the times in introductory classes, we talk about Schrodinger's approach because it's actually easier in a sense to understand, but it's still, honestly, the math behind it is, a, is way outside of the scope of this class. So uh, the point being in here is that uh, a wave mechanics based on the fact that particles have wave properties was developed. Okay, this is quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics from the get-go was based on probability of this function, this mathematical function, which cannot, should not really be represented, uh, cannot be represented on the, on the graph uh, because of the fact that it is what is known in math as complex function. So the fact that it is there just to help us as a tool to find the, uh, the, the, the properties of the system. So one way of interpreting this wave function is the so-called uh, probability amplitude, for example, from the presence of a given particle, such as an electron, for example, around the, an atom. And that takes then the square of the amplitude. Real or not, complex or not, it doesn't matter. Its amplitude is real. And its amplitude has a meaning now. It gives me the probability of finding an electron somewhere. So if you're looking for a region in space here, in this box, for example, and you would want to know uh, if an electron exists there or not. So what you do, you come to the psi and you square its amplitude. That's what you put the two bars in there, indicating you're not doing the function itself, but you're doing its amplitude and you're squaring it. And whatever value you have, it's going to be what is known as probability density. So you really have to multiply it by the volume of this region. So probability density, so that you know, is probability per unit volume. So really, if you want to know if an electron is really or, uh, there or not, and if there's volume, let's say, for example, for the sake of argument is V, I know it's an a small volume. So I'm going to multiply it by the volume, then I know with what probability is the electron there? I can't tell you for sure that the electron, let's say for example, the answer turned out to be 20%. Then I know the answer is within a 20% probability, there is an electron in there. You're asking that what happened to the 80% probability, the rest of the remainder of the probability. Well, in that case, there is an 80% chance that it's not there. It's not in this volume anyway, it's somewhere else. So that's basically the whole idea behind it. So from the get-go, this is a non-deterministic theory. And this alerted people. People did not believe something like this at all could be possible. One of them is Mr. Einstein. And he has his famous saying that God, because if you're telling me that this science basically describes everything, and this science is based on probability, meaning you cannot know for sure, then he said that this is not true. I mean, he said that his famous statement that God does not play dice, basically. That's what it is. It appeared like, okay, 20% chance it's there, 80% chance it's not. So he, get, he said his famous statement in there. So he, 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 he argued that there are some underlying phenomenon that we don't understand. 
that maybe can help us be more sure, be more deterministic. We will know exactly what the electron is. That is one issue that seems to be a problem for some people, but it seems like this theory, not only it's correct, but it is apparently the most correct theory there is. As a matter of fact, quantum mechanics, this science that we're looking at it, it is the most accurate science human, humans have ever invented, even with its probabilistic nature. I mean, so what I'm saying in here is that if you indeed go and do an experiment and try to find an electron in this volume, and you repeat this this experiment time and time again, you always are going to come up with a 20% probability if the answer was 20%. You're not gonna find it exactly there all the time. You're not gonna find it 21%. You're not gonna find it 20 and a half percent. You're not gonna find it 19.7%. The point being in here, if it said the theory is 20%, it's going to come exactly 20%. So that is the power of this theory. Anyway, so this led to some 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 uh, formulation. I know that I talked a little bit about the uh, the the particle in the box because the particle in the box helped us understand uh, a little bit, if you wish. The math behind the NL and ML and MS is way outside of the scope of this class. As a matter of fact. I taught that class for the engineering students, and it's even way outside of their school. Okay, you really have to go into a physics degree and basically major in trying to understand how to solve this equation, basically that I mentioned earlier in the Schrodinger's equation, which I did not even write, but I just mentioned it in here, try to solve it for the case of the hydrogen atom. And that's what this numbers, NL, ML, and MS emerge. And they emerge in a similar fashion to the particle in the box. The particle in the box, the reason why you have quantization, you have different levels of the energy is because the particle is confined in a box. I mean, the boundary conditions it cannot escape the boundaries. In a similar fashion, these numbers, N, L, and ML emerge in that similar fashion. Because you have a space, you have the radial direction. So if you take a nucleus, for example, and you take an electron around it, the electron can go in and out of the radius. That's one possibility. It can go around and around this way. That is another possibility. It can come out of the screen and can go into the screen also in a circular fashion. That is three possibility. Hence, these three numbers, n as an integer being one or two or three or four or so on and so forth, is really related to the radial displacement. Mm -hmm. The two numbers, L and ML, they have to do with these displacements and they're entangled actually with one another. They are not clearly one direction or the other, but they come in there. The last number, has to do with another experiment that was done. And that seems to show that the electrons, they seem to have an internal property that is actually called the spin. So this is actually a property of the particles themselves, okay? This is not necessarily for the atom. Every electron has a spin one half and has a spin or a spin negative one half, meaning it could be pointing up or down a right-handed electron or a left-handed electron. So basically, that's basically the idea behind it, okay? I, that's what you will find everywhere, okay? You'll find their value being one half and negative one half, the units of h over two pi, really. That's what the units of all angular momentum is. And the spin here is a kind of an angular momentum, okay? So this is basically the idea behind what these numbers are. And uh, I started talking, and it's very important to go about this probability issue also. So basically now we have a good model to understand the hydrogen atom, not only the hydrogen atom, actually the helium atom now, because this energy levels coming from the quantization of these numbers, 
N, L, and M, they can explain to me all of the elements in the periodic table now. They fit beautifully under this, this thing. So I have all of the elements in here listed up to 30. And it combined with something I know I mentioned last time, and that is a Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli exclusion principle, what it does is, What it does is it says that no two electrons can occupy the same energy level, meaning they cannot have the same N and at the same time have the same L in the same time, have the same ML in the same time, have the same MS. That's it. One of this has to be different, at least if not more. No two electrons can do that, okay? So this is true for electrons. Actually, it's also true, no two electrons. This is true also for protons, by the way. This is true also for neutrons. It is not true for photons. Photons, can have the same energy in the same place. This type of particles, namely electron, proton, neutron, and the slew of other particles, neutrinos, for example, and other particles that I'm not gonna mention here, but a huge number of them, okay? They're called actually fermions. Why? Because they obey Pauli exclusion principle. You cannot have two fermions in the same location with the same energy. This is important because if you take astronomy, you understand how neutron stars form. Actually, actually, before neutron stars, how white dwarf stars form. Because a white dwarf star, you start compacting materials after the star dies, like the sun, for example, until to a point where the electron starts to bump into each, into each other. And at that point, this principle comes in to prevent further collapse of that star. So that's called the electron degeneracy. In the case of neutron stars, actually, there is a lot of pressure on them. There is a lot of force of gravity that this electron is actually, they will be forced into the proton and they fuse with the proton to become neutrons. But now you have a bunch of neutrons inside the star. And again, because they are fermions, they cannot be in the same location. So they start bumping into each other and repelling each other using this principle. So that's what prevents actually a neutron star from further collapse. Obviously, you're asking what happened in the case of the black hole. The black hole in this case has a lot of matter that it's going to even overcome. The, uh, uh, this is called the neutron degeneracy, by the way, in the case of a neutron star. So it's going to further collapse to to uh, singularity. And that's what the black holes are. So black holes are really, they overcome, they overpower even this principle in here. Photons, for example, there is another particle called gluons that fixes the nucleus together. There is another particle called the, uh, nucleus just stick with just these two, okay? Actually, the case of helium also is uh, when it's uh, together, it's actually, it uh, behaves the same way. These are called bosons. Okay. This where Mr. Fermi and Dirac proposed this, this behavior. Then Bose was an Indian scientist, sent his paper because it was rejected because he was Indian, to the publisher to publish his work similar to Fermi Dirac, 
but because it was rejected, he asked Mr. Einstein. Mr. Einstein looked at it and added his name to it, and now it's known as Bose-Einstein statistics or behavior. Okay, so those are the two distinctions in here between the two family of uh, particles. Obviously, we are not getting into a lot of details because we have chemistry, we have how also solids behave. This discussion becomes very important on how solids like metals and non-metals and semiconductors and superconductors and all of these things, how they behave. It's all related to these things in here and how these things are, whether they behave one way or the other. In the case of superconductors, they actually start to form some sort of behavior similar to this ones. Okay, to a boson, so there is a pairing of electrons in there. Anyway, <clears throat> so the point I was earlier trying to make, and hopefully we can go back to it, namely the fact that uh, this statistic, this this science is probabilistic. Namely, I don't know. First of all, the function psi itself does not really have a, a, a meaning by itself, except for example through its square of its amplitude. So this is the square of the amplitude. That has a meaning, okay? It gives me the probability density, probability density, as I was saying earlier. Please remember these things. I know that you have an exam that is coming soon because you will be asked all kinds of questions. So make sure you have uh, you, you read the unit, you read the chapter, and you have a full understanding of these words because you're going to be asked all kinds of questions in there about them. So anyway, it's giving you probability density. And so it's probabilistic in nature. Mr. Uh, uh, Heisenberg developed their relationships based on this idea. And this relationship has to do with the two parameters that are uh, 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 they, they they work together. For example, the momentum and position. You can tell with pre precision the momentum and the position at the same time. There is the uncertainty. in momentum in a given direction. Because momentum is a vector, remember? Okay, so it has three directions. So it could be in the x direction, y direction, or z direction. Times the uncertainty in the position Again, the position is a vector also, because you could be going left, you could go being forward, you could go being upward. So you have also this in X and Y, Z direction too. Position uh, times the uncertainty in the position in that direction. So now it has to be the same direction. I know the book gave you a relationship. So the book says delta P in the Y direction, for example, times delta Y is greater than Planck's constant, okay? In other words, you cannot have this zero at all. Because if that's zero, that means that this must be infinite. If, if you know the position exactly, that's what means uncertainty is zero. You are certain for the electron is exactly in space, in the y direction. Then you have no idea what it is. I'm sorry, the momentum. <laughs> if you know the momentum exactly, you know how fast the, the electron is going exactly its speed, and you know its mass, of course, and its momentum. If you know its speed, you have no idea where the electron is, number one. Number two, if you know, for example, exactly where the electron is, you have no clue how fast it's moving. That's basically what this relationship is. So uh, the product of these two is greater than Planck's Constant, period. And you can do this with the y too. I know the book shows in the direction, so it's the same thing in the other one. You can do also this in the three direction. It's the same thing, but you can't mix and match. It has to be the same coordinates. That's one thing. So this is 
Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Obviously, this is not unique to the position and momentum. You could also have the energy in time. The product of the uncertainty in when I'm when I put delta, I remember guys from a discussion that we had a long time ago, even when we were doing the lab, when we write delta means the change. Okay. Or in this case, uncertainty, a gap. Okay. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Gap in energy. How certain are you in energy? Is it exactly one joule or is it one and a half joules or is it somewhere in between them? So if it's somewhere between one joule and one and a half joule, then I have an uncertainty of half a joule. If let's say, for example, I don't know the energy. Is the energy, for example, 100 joules? Or maybe, maybe it's 98 joules. Or maybe, maybe it's 102 joules. So I could say in this case, I have a delta E that is equal to two joules. In other words, I could say it's 100 joules plus or minus two joules. That's basically what I'm trying to say. So the uncertainty in this case is the vagueness with which I'm stating the fact that the energy is 100 joules is actually two joules. That's what I mean by the uncertainty, okay? It's not the value of the energy itself. It's how certain I am from that value, whatever the value is. So for the case, for example, of the, uh, the, uh, the ground state of the, the electron, it's negative 13.6 electron volt. But again, this is, if you go and do measurements, you're not gonna find negative 13.6 electron volts. You're gonna find it plus or minus. Remember the energy can be measured in electron volts or in joules, okay? So that you guys know, an electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Oops, what happened to my screen? Why did it go away? It's all gone away for some reason. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That's what an electron volt is, okay? So I know in the case of the hydrogen atom, we use the electron volt. In the case of all of the atoms, because their energy is so small that we just basically use the electron volt anyway. So some other places they might use other units, okay? Anyway, so the point being in here is that this is the, uh, the if, I, if I, that value of negative 13.6 times this number to convert it to joules, if you like, has, if you do an experiment, usually has an error in it. And that's what we talk about. So that's the error, not the percentage error. We mean the exact uncertainty in the value. So that is what delta E in this case. Delta T is the same fashion. For example, this happened at 10 a.m. Okay. But I'm not sure, honestly, was it 10 a.m. or 10.01 or 10.02 or 9.59 or something. So in this case, I would say 10 a.m plus or minus, for example, two minutes, okay? That's the vagueness in this case is this number. So that's what the delta T is, not the 10 a.m., not the 11 a.m., not the actual time measurement. I mean the uncertainty in time. This also is greater than H, where H is the same number. H is, remember, Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule second, okay? The essentially principle is actually a little bit more than that, actually. When we uh, were talking earlier about the angular momentum, for example, the angular momentum will have its value, which is L, and we have its direction, which is typically the Z direction, because if I know the, moment, the angular momentum in one direction I can, and know its value, I cannot really know the other two directions. There is an uncertainty about the other ones. So it's really the Heisenberg essentially principle that really dictates the structure of the atom, okay? So it's really the one that dictates these things in here. In other words, that's why when we took the angular momentum, the angular momentum has a value L, again, number, but usually it's an H over two pi units, okay? And then the projection in one direction, which is typically taken to be the z direction. So if it's not the z direction, just reorient your axis so that it's the z direction. So this is the components along a direction, typically the z direction. Okay, that's the projection 
of the angular momentum in that direction. So if you're going to apply a magnetic field to see the effects, apply it in this direction. And that is the value of that projection. Now, what happened to the other two directions? Well, we don't know them for sure. There is, we know them, if you wish, if I know the value for ML in this uh, direction and L in this direction. So I know them with this much uncertainty, which is also H. So that is basically the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. And it's a very, very powerful statement also because it helps us understand several things. Believe it or not, the way a black hole dies, at least if you take an astronomy class, is through this principle. That is the one that causes the black holes to die. Otherwise, black holes will go forever because there is a probability that a at in practically zero time, a pair of electron positron, for example, forms or particle or antiparticle form. One of them falls into the black hole, the other one comes out of the black hole, and the one that comes out of the black hole will carry energy from the black hole with it. And that causes the, uh, the black hole to lose energy over time. Of course, granted it's infinite amount of time practically for, <laughs> for us as well. It's going to take a long, long time, but black holes actually radiate energy through this process and they die in the end. So this is actually a very powerful principle. It helps us understand a lot of things with the, with the, with the, uh, with the, this one. There's also another reason for this one also, namely uh, it's Heisenberg principle that also dictates radioactivity, which is the essence of what's going on inside the stars or in here. So that's actually what furnishes the energy that comes to, to Earth from there. So it's a very, very powerful statement in here. And I hope that you guys will appreciate its value in here. And it has a lot of applications, actually. I'm trying to think of other than the fact that explaining what's going on in here in terms of the hydrogen atom and the periodic table, but also in terms of how the, the black holes do die and actually how the universe actually was created to begin with. Okay, this is actually if you analyze this one in here, this is really the uh, the, the 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 scale in here being each plank uh, each constant Planck's constant in here, the scale of which the universe was formed through a time that extended all the way to the first basically moment, which is the uh, Planck's epoch that is governed by this one. So trying to understand the evolution of the universe also relies on ideas that are borrowed from here. So this is a very powerful stuff. This is very powerful stuff. It helps us understand how the universe got created to begin with, and also helps us how black holes die, and helps us understand the hydrogen atom, helps us understand all of the atoms in the periodic table, and also helps us understand the uh, different processes that are happening in stars and everywhere else. So it's really powerful stuff, very powerful stuff. Anyway, the other last time and last item in this discussion here that we have is the idea that was predicted by this whole model, among other things, and a lot of things that were predicted, is the lasers. And lasers, so that you guys know, now that we know that a, a hydrogen atom or any other atom is made up of different energy levels and one and two and so on and so forth okay those are the different values of n and each n is divided into orbitals in here defined by l and ml so in this case if i excite an atom from an n1 to n3 by mechanism for example with a volt what is my laser it's in here i thought i saw that last time anyway if you have lasers, that's a technology, by, by, by the way, how you get it. So you build up a lot of population from different atoms, of course, not single atom, different atoms. You make them go to a certain energy level, okay? So now they are excited, usually within a voltage. And then you trigger, because if you let them on their own, they will basically decay back to N3 or N2 back to N2 or back to N1, okay? That's gonna happen. But what you do in this case, you say you send a beam in here that is going to excite, that corresponds to this transition from N3 to N2, for example. 
And that is going to have another beam, of course, it's going to be absorbed by another electron that was sitting in here and moves up. But now two electrons will emerge. So you have to send it in the right energy, but two photons will emerge. One of them will go and excite this one, and another one will go and excite this one. This will result in two more coming out. This will result in two more coming out. So all of a sudden you have a cascade of, of photons of the same frequency. So it's, it's the same frequency and they are coherent. They're in the same direction, not in all random directions. So it's a coherent beam of light of the same wavelength, namely the same color that emerge. That is really the essence of what the laser is. To excite the atom, the atoms, not one, okay? Using usually in this case for the case of a, a regular, uh, trying to see if I have it in here. If not, if we, we have still have lab, don't we? We have last lab next week, uh, which is on Monday. Anyway, the point being in here, I will try to get a laser and to basically demo it. It's really not hard. I mean, if you have a laser, you can point it anywhere and you can see the point behind it. So you use a voltage battery usually, and that battery excite the atoms inside the material in there to a certain energy level, depending on the voltage. So now they're excited. And then you start, you trigger one of them for a specific frequency, for a specific energy transition between two different levels. That one, of course, is absorbed, transition from one level to the next. Once it's absorbed, it's going to be emitted. But there is another one sitting also in that state. So it's going to also fall in that one. So now this is a stimulated, not, not spontaneous, stimulated emission. Spontaneous is when it happened on its own. And that does. But now you stimulate it to do, OK? So that is basically a light. What is this? Light amplification through stimulated emission. I don't remember what the R stands for, but it's a coherent wave in here. Probably should Google it, what lasers stands for. Light amplification. by stimulated emission of radiation. That's what the, word, the words are, okay? Light amplification by stimulated emission of ra and, uh, and radiation, okay? So that's basically the idea behind the lasers. So later on, sure enough, the model was predicted based on this theory and it was built and now they're, they're common practice. I mean, they're common, they're everywhere. They're toys actually for uh, small children to play with. So, uh, and they're used actually in technology, they're used in, uh, in med medicine, there is uh, all kinds of applications for them. Anyway, this is the unit that you guys have. The idea here is that we have brand new kind of science, namely quantum mechanics that helps us understand the ideas and also uh, understand, build on the success of the Borg model and actually extend it to some other ideas and uh, now we have a better understanding of everything else. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and I will see you guys next week. Thank you.